Greetings, Daniel here with an exciting interview for you. Before we kick it off, just want to say a couple opening remarks. It has been a long-standing debate going back even shortly after Nietzsche died about precisely how his philosophy infuses itself within the socialist movement, within the workers' movement. And um, Nietzsche's legacy on the left has, according to many, in some in some moments, in some points in history, actually gone to usurp even Marx, right? So this is actually a point that Leo Strauss and the Straussians make, although I don't agree with them ultimately, that especially in America, in the Cold War period, Nietzsche came to replace Marx for most of the left, especially after the tragedy of Stalinism, for example. What is the meaning of centering the philosophy of Nietzsche as a Marxist? I think this gets at the heart of the conversation we are about to have. Is are Nietzsche's aristocratic commitments a problem for the left? If they are, in what way? And how do those problems appear? This is a very interesting question. My guest today is Jan Raymond. He's the author of a book which has recently been translated into English, originally published in German, entitled Deconstructing Postmodernist Nietzscheanism on Deleuze and Foucault. Two prominent post-war French philosophers who were also unabashed Nietzscheans. The book is very, very interesting. Cornell West, as I mentioned, said that Deleuze's book, Nietzsche and Philosophy, could be seen as the Bible of postmodernism, right? The commitments that both of these thinkers have to re-interrogating the Nietzschean legacy, the Nietzschean philosophy, the Nietzschean approach to thinking, to being in the world, ethics, etc., politics, etc., is undeniable. Yet the question remains, what might those Nietzschean commitments do to harm a left project? So I begin my conversation asking Jan Raymond straight out what he thinks about the new translation of Domenico Lucerto's Aristocratic Rebel, which was released in English in 2020. Listeners to this program will know that I personally find Lucerto's effort quite valuable. Many on the left do not and find the book quite difficult to bear. People feel that Lacerdo's treatment of Nietzsche effectively aims to cancel Nietzsche. I think you're about to find out that that is not the case. Maybe the Marxist view on Nietzsche is the only way in which we can truly preserve something of Nietzsche. We can turn Nietzsche into, uh, we, can, we can learn from the enemy. But first, we have to agree that in fact we're dealing with an enemy. So, Jan Raymond is affiliated as a professor at the Free University of Berlin, as well as at Union Theological Seminary in New York. He's the author of Postmodernist, Deconstructing Postmodernist Nietzscheanism as well as theories of ideology. All of his stuff is really great. I've been extremely enthusiastic about learning about his work, and I highly recommend that you check it out. Okay, on to the show. Welcome to the program. Uh, Jan, how are you today? I'm fine, and thank you for having me. I hope you are well as well. Yes, it's really an honor to read your book. I was challenged in looking at this material and as listeners to our program will know, the Marxist critique or the Marxist uh, left perspective on Nietzsche has experienced in the Anglo Academy and, uh, and outside of it a bit of a renaissance, especially now with the English translation, also by historical materialism of Domenico Lucerto's Aristocratic Rebel, uh, which is a kind of intellectual biography and critical balance sheet on Friedrich Nietzsche. This uh, book 
uh, puts forward the notion of what Losurdo refers to as the hermeneutics of innocence. And um, Jan's uh, analysis of the philosophers Deleuze, Gilles Deleuze, and Michel Foucault, two preeminent uh, late 20th century philosophers whose work still lives uh, very much with us today, um, incorporate, you incorporate quite a lot of Losurdo's uh, methodologies into into your study, and I'd like to begin our conversation, if we could, um, with a uh, discussion in your view about the achievement of Losurdo's wider wider effort with the aristocratic rebel. I understand that you were one of the main editors of the book from Italian into German. Um, what do you see as the most uh, significant part of Losurdo's effort? I got to know Losurdo's book, Nietzsche, Il Ribelle Aristocratico, uh, when I was writing my dissertation, my Habilitation, which is a kind of second dissertation, um, on postmodernist Nietzscheanism in Germany. Um, and I discovered immediately um, that our interests and approaches uh, intersect in a very fruitful way. I got in touch with him, and uh, we arranged uh, that I'm going to publish his book in Germany with the Argument Verlag, and he helped me in turn to get my postmodernist Nietzscheanism book translated and published in Italy, I Nietzscheani di Sinistra. So based on this uh, cooperation, we were on several panels together in Germany and in Italy and had many fruitful discussions. So I, I really learned a lot uh, from Lesotho's uh, what he calls uh, comparative analysis of ideological processes. So he looks at the different periods of Nietzsche's work and teases out both uh, the continuities and the ruptures. And he analyzes these different periods ag against the backdrop uh, of the respective hegemonic constellation or conjuncture. Um, and it's only after having carefully reconstructed Nietzsche's discourse in the ideological network of his own time that one can approach the problem um, of how to investigate and how to assess uh, continuities and discontinuities with the Third Reich. So, and that was important for my research because the debate on Nietzsche in Germany, I think it's not only in Germany, but maybe in particular in Germany, uh, was kind of stuck uh, in a false uh, alternative, either to hold Nietzsche's philosophy directly responsible for German fascism and for the Holocaust, uh, which always has a side effect of easing the burden of the non-Nietzschean philosophies um, that had also their share in the ideological preparation of fascism, or to exonerate Nietzsche uh, of this responsibility, of any responsibility. Uh, for example, by putting the blame on Nietzsche's malicious, allegedly malicious sister who falsified his uh, innocent philosophy in the direction of Nazism. Now, Lasordo uh, demonstrates in detail that this is an untenable myth, uh, furthermore, a patriarchal one. Whenever something goes wrong, there's uh, a woman to be blamed. Um, and a similar debate, very, very uh, tightly connected to that, is obviously um, uh, about Nietzsche's anti Semitism or anti anti Semitism, as some scholars, many scholars, assert. And it's a debate that that tends to fizzle out in offsetting anti-Jewish quotes against uh, pro-Jewish quotes uh, of Nietzsche that exist as well, especially in this middle period. So the Soto's nuanced analysis helped me to overcome these deadlocked debates. Uh, let me give you an example. So Nietzsche's response to the democratic and socialist challenges of his time was an uttermost aristocratic and elitist uh, attitude. Uh, Nietzsche belonged to an aristocratic reaction that penetrated the higher strata of 
political institutions between, uh, uh, let's say, at the end of the 19th century uh, until 1914 or so, not only in Germany, that's an important point for for uh, Lesotho, um, but in Europe in general and also in the United States. So, and his anti-Semitism was part of a classism from above against the subaltern classes. However, fascism emerged in a different way. It emerged as a right-wing populist movement, which claimed to integrate the masses, the subaltern classes, into a German Volksgemeinschaft, uh, while, of course, uh, annihilating the labor movement, annihilating any uh, representation of the masses uh, in civil society and so on, and also uh, democratic uh, institutions in civil society, not only uh, labor movement. And this German and Aryan Volksgemeinschaft was obviously uh, construed uh, in racist terms, against other people, and in particular against the Jews, and here uh, against both uh, Jewish Bolshevism and against the Jewish financial capital. You see my uh, quotation marks, distancing quotation marks. So the point is now, there is a difference that needs to be taken into account between Nietzsche's uh, uh, kind of reactionary attitude and uh, the fascist one. And Lusurdo carefully distinguishes between Nietzsche's elitist anti-Semitism, which he describes as a transversal racialization, uh, transversal cutting across uh, history um, or the class structure, uh, transversal racialization directed at the subaltern classes and, and their intellectuals, and a horizontal racism uh, that racializes the differences between peoples and nations. So uh, when Nietzsche, for instance, says in the Antichrist, quote, we would no more choose the first Christians to associate with than Polish Jews. Why? They both do not smell good. End of quote. This is clearly an elitist anti-Semitism directed against two movements uh, of the poor, uh, the early Christian slave revolts, uh, re revolt in morals, um, and the poor Jewish migrant workers coming from Eastern Europe. And at the same time as um, uh, Nietzsche uses these anti-Semitic stereotypes, um, he um, hated the populist anti-Semites of his time. He wanted to have these ballers banned from Germany and even shot at the spot in one of his uh, uh, last little uh, notes. He hated them because he hated populism. So and many Nietzscheans conclude uh, from this and from other uh, quotes that Nietzsche was not an anti-Semite and had nothing to do with these vulgar worldviews of the Nazis. But this is an over hasty and uh, utter, utterly uh, unfounded conclusion because it overlooks the fact that radical aristocratism could indeed be integrated into the project of a fascist hegemony. Um, and this was possible among others because racist discourses can easily uh, oscillate between an elitist anti-Semitism and a populist anti-Semitism. So obviously, Nietzsche's elitist racism alone is not very helpful uh, for right-wing or fascist leaders when they try to mobilize the subaltern classes against the Weimar Republic or against the foreign enemy. Uh, why should soldiers risk their lives for the fatherland when they are considered by the elites of that fatherland uh, uh, as being despicable, rabble, scum, Chandala. So Lesotho gives some examples of how this uh, transversal racism was translated into a horizontal racism and back again. Um, so the role of Nietzsche for the Nazis is not an immediate outgrowth of his philosophy, but the connection is mediated by manifold processes of fascistization, 
that's a kind of strange word in, in, um, in English, I suppose. It's in German, it's Fascisierung, the, the process of rendering something, of, of becoming fascist or of rendering something fascist. So, and the main task of this fascistization is to ensure this mutual translation so that classism from above and populist racism overlap and permeate, uh, uh, permeate uh, each other. So, uh, this is, for example, what uh, Martin Heidegger uh, is doing when he argues that the mass scorned by Nietzsche referred not to the workers and peasants, but rather to the mediocre cultural Philistines. So Hitler's discourse permanently oscillates between invoking the threat of an imminent socialist revolution and a Jewish world domination, or he couches also the uh, socialist revolution in, in, in the terminology of a Jewish world domination. The Nazis absorbed every ideology that helped them in their struggle against democracy and socialism. And for that, they could use Nietzsche very well, but also many of his enemies, Bismarck and Luther and, and many more. So what inspired me the most was Lusoda's critique of what he calls a hermeneutics of innocence, as you mentioned. So uh, this kind of hermeneutic subjugates even Nietzsche's bluntest statements from the support of slavery to the annihilation of the weak uh, and the degenerate um, to an allegorical pattern of interpretation. So uh, Lusoda goes through different strategies for exonerating Nietzsche and demonstrates their inconsistencies and fallacies. Um, and an uh, important point for me was uh, Lusoda's argument that this hermeneutics depoliticizes an explicit political philosopher who was proud of his uncompromising aristocratic radicalism, as Nietzsche himself called it. So we need to take his political intervention seriously um, um, and only by putting forward the reactionary and elitist character of his philosophy can we do justice to him, uh, to Nietzsche, and uh, to what Lusoda calls the theoretical surplus of Nietzsche's thinking? So, and this argument coincided nicely with my critique of Deleuze and Foucault's reading of Nietzsche. Fabulous, yeah. I really appreciate the focus on transversal racialization. I always, in my reading of the book, I considered it... Um, and in, my, in the book that I'm working on, on, on Marxism and Nietzsche, I considered Lucerto's idea of Nietzsche's racism as a almost um, form of racism which can, can describe contemporary racism perhaps better in a certain way. Um, and it's, it's one of Nietzsche's perhaps uh, contributions of a mode of analysis. It's obviously, because um, I think there's a difference between uh, Nietzsche's political agenda and Nietzsche as a philosopher of social power, you know, in that sense, transversal racialization describes a certain formation of capitalist racism quite maybe accurately. Uh, mm -hmm. Now we're going to return to the hermeneutics of innocence, but I'd like to, for the benefit of listeners, uh, throw onto the table uh, perhaps one of the first uh, robust Marxist oriented critiques of Nietzsche. It's not the first. I remember uh, Leon Trotsky's first journal article that he had published was a critique of Nietzsche. So there, there's a long history in the second international period of Marxist critiques of Nietzsche. And Franz Mehring. Yeah. But Lukács in The Destruction of Reason, which was actually published in the 1950s, early 1950s, stands out as presenting a very uh, robust and very, um, let's say, very critical. <laughs> I got him in trouble with uh, Adorno, for example. Can you give us your appraisal of Lukács' critique of Nietzsche? Um, yes. Um, so uh, Lukács' destruction of reason has certainly many merits, um, and one of them is to spell out Nietzsche's throughout hostility to the French Revolution and to socialist movements, 
afterwards, in the wake of the French Revolution. Um, and uh, the socialist movement had their first breakthrough in the Paris Commune of 1871, uh, the first uh, socialist revolution, which was drowned in blood uh, immediately. And this revolution was experienced by Nietzsche and dramatized by Nietzsche as a traumatic event. He even fantasized that the revolutionaries had burned the Louvre uh, to the ground. So Lukas analyzed Nietzsche's growing disappointment in Bismarck's politics, which in his eyes, in Nietzsche's eyes, uh, was incapable of uh, putting down the threat of socialism and, and preventing the Social Democratic Party from, from winning one election after the other, or from, uh, from growing uh, uh, in, from, from one election uh, to the other. Um, um, the late Nietzsche's transvaluation of all values aims at an aristocratic rule by a merciless master race over the mass, ma masses without any democratic mediation. And Lucas clearly saw that Nietzsche's Oberman ethics was exclusively a morality uh, of militant factions of the ruling class. He had some difficulty, though, to explain Nietzsche's appeal for discontent milieus, uh, for instance, uh, for youth. Uh, movements that rebelled against the conservative morality of their parents and uh, older generations. Um, so it, there was a difficulty of reception of uh, Lukash's uh, work. It was uh, received, um, especially in the West, uh, from the outset as part of a dogmatic Stalinist conception of history uh, based uh, on the notion of an objective progress towards socialism. For instance, Enzo Traverso wrote the introduction to the new edition of uh, Destruction of, uh, Re uh, of Reason, um, argues um, that Destruction of Reason is part of Lukas' third period, his Stalinist period from the 1930s uh, to about uh, 1956. So you have a little detour, you have a, a, a first period, a useful romanticism, uh, 1912, 1916, around soul and form or theory of the novel. Then you get a second leftist radical uh, period of Lukash um, around uh, history and class consciousness. And then the third period that I just mentioned, which he describes as um, Stalinist uh, period. And then uh, a fourth period from 1956 onwards, uh, when uh, Lukas abandoned Stalinism and uh, founded the so-called Budapest School and wrote his last masterpiece, Ontology of uh, Social Being. So, um, um, according to the logic of the Cold War, you get a progressing socialism on one side and a decaying imperialism on the other side. And against this backdrop, Lukas proposed, an, uh, I think, an all too simplistic and schematical uh, division between an ascending rational line of bourgeois philosophy culminating in Hegel. And then from about 1815 onwards, a descending, a descending and increasingly decadent line of irrationalism. Uh, culminating in Nietzsche and then segueing into the ideology of Nazism. So in this supposedly straight line of irrationalism from the late Schelling through Schopenhauer, Kierkegaard and Nietzsche uh, to Rosenberg and Hitler is, is problematic in several aspects. You can see that already by my discussion of, uh, of, of Lusodo's nuanced analysis. So. The idea of a direct line between Nietzsche and Na Nazism skips over uh, a considerable historical distance, not quantitatively, but qualitatively, namely uh, between Nietzsche's death and the beginning of fascist movement. There was the world historical event of World War I, and there was the world historical event of the October uh, Revolution in Russia, and both um, events changed the hegemonic landscape uh, in a fundamental way. Um, fascism and uh, Nazism are to be analyzed first and foremost as specific 
outcomes to no outcomes of uh, this hegemonic crisis or responses to this uh, hegemonic crisis. It is at this point that Lusodo, who was certainly inspired by by Lukas in in many way, uh, takes his distance uh, from Lukas and and declares that the assertion of an immediate connection between Nietzsche and Nazism is a historiographical distortion. So methodically speaking, Lukas transformed the dialectics of ideological class struggles into a teleology. Um, that is, um, the philosophies in question are defined not in their own terms and in relation to the uh, hegemonic constellation into which they intervene, um, but they are defined uh, in the perspective of an end result, Nazism and, and its genocide. And what is sidelined in this teleological approach are exactly the ideological struggles about the interpretation of Nietzsche uh, that I mentioned before. In particular, the manifold processes of fascistization, which need to be analyzed always as concrete interventions in the, into the respective uh, hegemonic conjuncture. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, let, let me add another point. I forgot one, one point, which is, is it okay, Daniel? Please, please. Um, it's also, I think, problematic to subsume every philosopher de uh, deviating from Hegel's dialectics to the notion of irrationalism. Mm -hmm. So if you try to do that with uh, Nietzsche, just to take that example, um, you run into problems with when you deal with uh, Nietzsche's so-called enlightened middle period after after his break uh, with Wagner. Uh, that's the period from about uh, 1876 uh, to the end of 1882. So because during this period, Nietzsche actually comes out against any irrational uh, mythology. Mm -hmm. And in favor of the progress of natural science, he attacks idealism, the world of ideals and metaphysics in the name of the spirit of science, a psychological dissecting table, a school of suspicion. Um, and then when Nietzsche transitions then uh, to his late period, when he uh, writes his Zarathustra, so he continues his line of an ideology critique in, par in part at least, but at the same time he establishes his own metaphysics of power and aristocratic domination. Mm. Which you could say that has certain uh, irrational char char characteristics, but in any case, the relationship between reason and irrationality or mm. irrationalism is more complex mm -hmm. than uh, Lucas' uh, yeah. uh, dichotomy. I, I I can see your line of argumentation, and I I think you are. There's many good points. I think, however, Lukács's idea of aristocratic epistemology, which starts from Schelling, and goes to Schopenhauer, and then to Nietzsche, and there's other figures, but those are the main ones, presents a rebuttal of Hegelian rationalism, because it reinforces the. Um, an element of an aristocratic uh, preservation of supra individualism. It uh, swaps in mythology. Uh, it, it, it focuses on the philosopher as possessing a unique point of access to supra rational uh, or supra sensible realities. And this then allows for philosophy to steer away from its um, foundation in Hegelian rationalism. And then Lukács says something even further interesting, which is the proletarian workers movement of the uh, basically post 1848 up to World War I period absorbed what was left of the Hegelian project. And that became immunitized. So that is an interesting story that he's telling about history, I feel. Uh, when we look at it after the war, maybe it doesn't look the same, right? Because irrationalism uh, takes on something completely different. And then I think what the Frankfurt School does with instrument instrumentalization of reason, in a way, builds off of uh, Lukács' theory of irrationalism, perhaps. Um, so that would be my response to that. In other words, there is an aristocratic epistemology of Nietzsche. 
do you do you think that this idea is important as one response? I was wondering, do you do you find that because I know you see the problems of irrationalism, but what do you think about the aristocratic epistemology argument? Uh, that is certainly uh, correct, uh, especially for the late uh, Nietzsche. I, I would need to think it through whether that's correct uh, for the middle Nietzsche. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not exactly sure, but let, let me let, let me say something uh, about Lukas. Um, he does the same in literary in, in, in literary theory, uh, as you know. So you have a ascending line to uh, to to uh, to uh, literary realism, um, and then you have a descending line, and Kafka, for instance, and expressionism is then an expression of uh, is an expression of irrationalism and mm -hmm. subjectivism and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm a little bit more, I mean, I'm not so much interested in the polemics of, of Adorno against Lukács. Uh, uh, Adorno who says the destruction of uh, reason is uh, actually the, the destruction of Lukács reason. Okay, I'm not so, in, so much interested in that kind of polemics. But I'm, uh, in, in that example of, of uh, expressionism, you uh, could see, the, the, look at the debate between Lukas on the one hand and Ernst Bloch on the other hand, and Bertolt Brecht uh, also on uh, on the other hand, <laughs> who argue, come on, Lukas, with your labeling of irrationalism and, and subjectivism, you overlook the resistant subversive elements that are in expressionism. This outburst of protest against the things they are. So you have a kind of uh, labeling, dear Lukas, that uh, that that in a way overlooks exactly the revolutionary potentials mm. Mm. They, th that are in expressionism, sometimes in myth in mythological form or in mythical form. But you have to release that and mm. not just label it and then be done with it. Yeah, so. yeah. That's and I think point. that is true for the history of philosophy as well, I think. But, yeah, uh, I think it's true. I think that the you see the same in American socialist uh, organizations and movements prior to the First World War and their relationship to pragmatism and the philosophy of Dewey and James. And it became a question for Lukács of the purity of Marxist praxis and Marxist philosophy. And he was allergic to anything that would pollute Marxist purity, I feel. You know, there was a bit of this problem. And I, th I think that uh, this leads me to my next question, actually, which is Nietzsche, no doubt, is a thinker of great uh, reaction and of aristocratic uh, uh, agenda, which is uh, deep rooted without question, although some postmodernists who may be reading Nietzsche in translation from Walter Kaufman, they may they may miss that point, which is a basic a basic point that um, should be centered. But nonetheless, are there lessons in the philosophy of Nietzsche, in your opinion, that might be worth retaining for a broader, more egalitarian, socialistic view uh, of philosophy and of the world? Yeah, uh, the point, the problem is, it's for the most time very difficult to separate uh, the potentially fruitful aspects from the uttermost reactionary settings they are part of. So, for example, when Nietzsche looks uh, for a genealogy of morals, um, uh, he derives it, he derives the notion of good and bad, etc., from an ancient class divide between the nobles and the plebeians. So one could say uh, that similar to Marx, he deciphers every domain of history, morals, religion, science, and art um, as a kind of class struggle. Uh, with the difference, however, uh, of considering it in an ahistorical way um, as an eternal struggle between masters and slaves and he asserts that aristocratical rule is the origin of uh, human history, which is obviously a mythical construct. Here, here one could really speak of a kind of irrational construct. So, or 
take Nietzsche's critique of metaphysics. He recognizes that the ideal depth of truth and, uh, and the true consciousness is an idealistic invention of philosophers. And he argues that the assumption of a knowledge per se, um, and I quote now uh, this assumption, suppresses the active and interpreting forces through which seeing becomes a seeing of a something. There is only seeing from a perspective. And the more eyes, different eyes, we train on the same thing, the more complete will be our idea of that thing, our objectivity. So, end of quote. So, so far, when you look at that quote, for instance, the Nietzschean perspectivism could, would not be so far from uh, the Marxist notion um, that the product of human thinking uh, are to be analyzed in connection to the underlying social positions and, and practices. But then, or at the same time even, uh, Nietzsche's perspectivism flips over into a fictionalism. Truth is nothing but fake, uh, bare fiction made of fictitious things, etc., etc. Um, I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, 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 way of um, it's an interesting shift because uh, he acknowledges and recognizes that knowledge and truth has something of human relationships in it and uh, instead of studying these human relationships as, as, as Marxists would do he denounces that as being fake as being a lie uh, so that's typically Nietzsche Nietzsche move uh. So uh, Foucault will adopt this concept of uh, fiction um, uh, pretty early on. And this is, of course, uh, incompatible with the Marxist epistemology. In the words of Ernst Bloch, uh, quote, fictionalism gobbles up cognition altogether. It transforms scientific concepts most usefully into shared certificates which fluctuate according to the given situation. It thus runs through large parts of the modern thinking, easy, comfortable, faceless. You would, uh, end of quote, you would say today it, uh, large, it, it runs through large parts of postmodern thinking um, in a pretty comfortable way. So the same applies to Nietzsche's critique of ideology, which is not irrational per se. For instance, <clears throat> his critique of Christian or humanistic ideologies of class harmony or reconciliation has even some intersections with the ideology critique of Marx, but it is formulated from an opposite perspective, from the standpoint of a merciless ruling elite. So this, this means that the left can appropriate some of it, but not and never, never without changing the whole framework, the whole arrangement. Um, I could go on and on. There are so many valuable, interesting sparks uh, in, in Nietzsche's writing, that, that, and that is one of, the, uh, one of the reasons why it's so appealing. Uh, you yourself uh, argue in your book, Proposal uh, of Perspectivism or Praxis, that Nietzsche's critique of resentment can also be used by the left in order to identify negative attitudes that block us from realizing a fuller mode of living. I, I agree completely. As long as people's discontent is uh, only a negative resentment without life-affirming images um, and visions of a better life for all, it can easily be exploited by the right. But it's not so easy to appropriate that critique of, uh, of uh, resentment either. Because for Nietzsche, everything, every resistance that comes from below is resentment. Right. He cannot distinguish, distinguish between resentment and active life-affirming forms of resistance, but for us, this distinction mm. is, uh, is, is, is a crucial point. Yeah, that's a great point. I think uh, it's important to recognize that Nietzsche wrote a lot about the worker struggle of his time and that those observations were the backbone of his theory of resentment. And one of the important points there that Ishe Landa points out in his reading of Nietzsche is that Nietzsche recognized that 
the and elements of the working class need to accept a life of mediocrity. That mediocrity at a mass level is necessary. So in a sense, what Nietzschean resentment is about is about a theory of society in which the production of high art, aesthetics, etc., um, is one in which a lower class acknowledges itself as a lower class and remains happy in their toil as a lower class. The problem of socialism for Nietzsche was that socialists told the working class that they shouldn't be happy in their work, in their toil. You see my point? This mm -hmm. was the great catastrophe of the socialist movement. And it was every, every socialist position, because everybody says, oh, well, Nietzsche has something to teach socialists because Marx was also critical of utopian socialism. That's true to a certain extent. But overall, the philosophy was fundamentally antithetical to any socialist orientation. And I think that that needs to be um, put, put into the center. Anyways, there's much to be said about this, and I really appreciate your thing. But I want to switch now to dig more into your new book uh, on postmodernist Nietzscheanism. And I'd like to start with the philosopher Gilles Deleuze, if I could. Uh, Jill Deleuze wrote a book called Nietzsche and Philosophy, which is seen as one of the most influential uh, late 20th century readings of Nietzsche. People call it a postmodern Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, and even Cornell West, uh, you reference Cornell West, recognizes that this book by Deleuze really centered Nietzsche and postmodernism very uh, centrally. Mm -hmm. uh, I really like Cornell West's point. However, what is your reading as to why Deleuze uh, neglects this political dimension, the emphasis on rank order, the emphasis on brutality, on cruelty, uh, right, that the overman must possess? You don't see any of those um, intentions or sentiments, which are obviously a part of Nietzsche's work. Can you, can you talk a little bit about how Deleuze erased some of these aspects? Yeah. Uh, let, let me make a little uh, remark. Uh, it, it's already the second time that you say it's a new book on my, my new book on postmodernism. Ah, uh, in all, in English. I, no, I, I, need to, I need to specify that. It is a, a book that I've written uh, in my habilitation, which is older. In Germany, it came out in 2004. And... But I have uh, widened it. I have enlarged it uh, a yeah. lot. Uh, right. The fifth part on on the on the late Foucault. So just uh, <laughs> I don't new, know. new for me, new for us, new for us. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, but I, I want to be uh, transparent you. in that. Sure. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, the question of why Deleuze is doing what he's doing is a kind of difficult one. Let let me focus on uh, what he's doing and how he's doing. Um, I take as a case in point Nietzsche's paces of distance and the way Deleuze interprets it in his uh, classic book, uh, Nietzsche et la Philosophie in, of uh, 1962. Um, so Nietzsche describes it in the genealogy of morals as a pathos of nobility, the feeling of complete and fundamental superiority of a higher ruling kind in relation to a lower kind to those below, end of quote. And Nietzsche makes crystal clear that for him, the terms noble and master are to be understood in a social sense. The German uh, term is im ständischen Sinne, which means in the sense of caste or in the sense of estate, more precisely, estate. Um, and his examples were the ancient Greek aristocracy, the Roman warrior, the Aryan conquering uh, race and uh, the magnificent blonde beast, uh, all of which are seen as the original classes. So Nietzsche's perspective is clearly that of an aristocratic classism from above. So Deleuze renders Nietzsche's pathos quote as uh, pathos of distance and of difference. So, and he's mostly interested in the difference part. 
Um, so he associates that with uh, a seemingly innocent term, namely difference. And then he goes on and interprets Nietzsche's uh, uh, class oppositions, what was Nietzsche, class opposition in Nietzsche, Nietzsche's discourse. And he interprets it as a differenti differ differential element that distinguishes between an active force on the one hand and a reactive force on the other hand an affirmative will on the one hand and a negative will on the other hand. So you can see that Nietzsche's point of an original class opposition has completely vanished. And by this allegorical interpretation, the staunch anti-democratic, uh, anti-socialist um, philosopher Nietzsche morphs into what Deleuze actually calls a nomadic rebel uh, who is supposedly much more radical and much more subversive uh, than Marx and Freud because he, Nietzsche, decodifies both the state and the family and helps us develop a war machine, war machine against the state. So you can see here an, an ultra uh, radical and militant discourse and Nietzsche re-emerges, resurfaces here in this kind of, on the side of uh, militant gauchism, uh, leftist radicalism. So, and the basic philosophical operation that underlies Nietzsche's shift to the radical left is to disguise him as Spinoza. The cornerstone of this rapprochement is um, the equating of their power concepts. Uh, but these power concepts are uh, actually completely opposite. Spinoza's concept of power, of potentia agendi, is never used in the sense of uh, domination over others, uh, but is oriented towards relations of synergy uh, with others. It designates a cooperative capacity to act. And the power concept of the late Nietzsche means, however, conquest overwhelming, taking mastery over the less powerful, exploitation, suppression of the weak, even violation and rape. Um, all of which uh, supposedly uh, belongs uh, to the nature of the living being. So Nietzsche's famous concept, uh, will to power, which he introduces for the first time in, in, in November 1882, which is one of the markers between the middle uh, uh, Nietzsche and, and the late Nietzsche. So uh, this uh, syntagma, will to power, has a function to naturalize the principle of oppression and domination and to anchor it in, in the essence of life itself. Nietzsche was indeed influenced by Spinoza in his middle period. Um, but then uh, he distances him, himself more and more from, from, from uh, Spinoza also with uh, anti-Semitic undertones, or not only undertones, with uh, anti-Semitic language. Um, um, and then when the late Nietzsche adopts Spinoza's equation of virtue and power in the sense of potentia agenda, virtue and capacity to act. So that is one of uh, Nietzsche's, uh, uh, sorry, of Spinoza's uh, interesting uh, ethical statements. Huh? capacity to act and, and virtue. So he adopts that, but he turns it completely around. It becomes a kind of hostile uh, takeover. So because it's not used for an empowerment of uh, the weak, it's used in the perspective of the annihilation um, of the weak. So I quote uh, from the Antichrist, the weak and ill-constituted shall perish, first principle of our philanthropy, and one shall help them to do so, end of quote. So Nietzsche has uh, thus overpowered Spinoza's capacity to act, has incorporated it into his power of domination, and he fantasizes this power of domination uh, further to the annihilation of the weak. So, and to overlook that, uh, glaring opposition, as, as Deleuze does, between social cooperation, power as social cooperation, on the one hand, and 
projected genocide is, is, ob is obviously utterly irresponsible and, and scandalous intellectually and politically and ethically. Yeah, that's very helpful. And there's so much to be said. It's a, um, an extremely uh, rich section of your book where you discuss Deleuze's work on Nietzsche. And I guess one question I would have is because, you know, at a certain point you referenced it, that Nietzsche becomes a nomadic rebel uh, for the counterculture. And then, of course, Nietzscheanism becomes a part of the youth revolt of the May 68 period, which was a period in which Marxism was uh, put under scrutiny by Deleuze. And there is a... So this leads me to my next question, which is, uh, in general, does, does leftist Nietzscheanism compromise um, the... What, what does it compromise? One, one possibility is that it really compromises the importance of equality and egalitarian thinking or um, uh, the centrality of, of, of it within socialist thought. In other words, maybe Nietzsche gives uh, sanction to, to deprivilege any conversation on egalitarianism within the socialist movement. Uh, what do you make of that argument? Do you, do you see that? This, this is valid. Um, um, let me go back a little bit and, and think about what leftist Nietzscheanism is. I mean, or maybe that the question is a little bit too broad because there are certainly several kinds of leftist Nietzscheanism. But uh, I'm talking a little bit more about the Deleuzian kind of leftist Nietzscheanism. Um, and I think uh, this can be explained by uh, Nietzsche's skill uh, to coach uh, his perspective of unfettered domination in the language of a free and active affirmation of life without any moralistic uh, restraints or constraints. And uh, this is what I describe as Nietzsche's Spinozian disguise. Um, actually, I mean, we have to be aware that Nietzsche actually developed a powerful language uh, for the articulation of active and formative attitudes. And I, I, we can imagine, uh, we need to imagine that this has an invigorating effect of many people. That not, that's not just the elite. So uh, leftist Nietzscheans accept and reproduce this Spinozian disguise. Um, so they do not pull apart the, the life-affirming language on the on one hand and the standpoint of domination on the other hand and, and deconstruct this kind of connection, which is completely arbitrary uh, that Nietzsche is doing. So um, if, and as, uh, as far, leftist Nietzscheans accept that and leave that unchallenged, uh, they re reproduce this kind of uh, arbitrary connection and uh, they develop a radical militant discourse and at the same time carry along an elitist and anti-egalitarian standpoint as, as you mentioned. Um, Ishai Landa has um, developed an interesting um, thesis about that, namely that Nietzsche's enormous influence on popular culture has created an elective affinity between an outright elitism on the right and a critical elitism on the left. And uh, I think that's, that's, that's right. Um, uh, I think that an ethics inspired by Nietzsche's philosophy can never get rid of its inherent paces of distance, um, which is uh, necessarily combined with an attitude of indifference towards humanity, of humanity's problem, misery. And, and this um, manifests itself this um, passes of distance, even in the most leftist forms um, as a celebration of social distinctions against ordinary unenlightened people. Yeah, it's very, uh, it's very true. It's very true. It's a long history, though, too, because, you know, I am in my in my work on Nietzsche, I'm writing about Jack London, who is a great socialist agitator in the United States, uh, you know, pre World War One figure. Mm -hmm. famous author of novels, but he also was a pro-Bolshevik socialist, uh, also he was a Nietzschean, mm -hmm. but he wanted to flip Nietzsche on its head and take the Superman 
mythology for proletarian liberation. So, but, but, uh, yeah, please. Again, can I say something about it? I try to make the difference between people who who use Nietzsche mm -hmm. and are aware of Nietzsche's reactory character, take some elements out, flip it around, use it for other purpose. I'm not sure. I, I for instance, I'm not sure whether I would um, uh, call uh, Adorno, uh, whatever his mistakes in reading Nietzsche are, a, a leftist Nietzsche, because I see Adorno more as someone who does that. And Brecht is doing that. And I Bloch see. is doing that. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'd be a little bit careful to uh, name them all leftist Nietzsche. Ne leftist Nietzscheism are, for me, those who... Uh, Maybe that, that's disputed, but I use leftist Nietzscheanism for those who overlook the aristocratic character. Yeah, yeah. Try to sell uh, Nietzsche in a kind of watered-down mm -hmm. uh, version. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very helpful distinction. That uh, This has been wonderful conversation. This draws me now to Michel Foucault, uh, who is certainly qualifies, I think, in the latter camp like Deleuze, as a leftist Nietzschean. Uh, and there's no debate about that. He confesses his allegiance uh, frequently. Um, can you talk a little bit about Foucault's idea of power, which is, of course, extremely influential, okay, um, and how it links back to Nietzsche's conception of will to power? Um, mm -hmm. Does Foucault's Nietzschean, the foundation of his thought, uh, undermine perhaps the the critical edge of his of his wider project. Yeah. Um, so at first glance, when you look at uh, Foucault's um, um, uh, deliberations on on power, you can see a huge variety and and. Uh, uh, of different power concepts, you get a sovereign power manifested in the pre-modern torture spectacles, have an old power of death that wields the right to take life or, or let live. You get a disciplinary power emerging, let's say, in the 17th and 18th century, um, which uh, subjugates the individual bodies um, in the prison system, in the army, in the school system, throughout a disciplinary society. You get biopower, power over life, from the middle of the 18th century onwards, which focuses on the life of the population, the, the, uh, the species body, as uh, Foucault calls it, by demographics, public hygiene, medical services, insurance system, social security in general. It's a very, very wide uh, spectrum. Um, school attendance, so on. Um, so, and, and I could go on, governmentality is also a kind of uh, a power concept, but I leave it at that. So all the different varieties share a common characteristic, even a common denominator. Namely, power is always connected to the will to knowledge and the will to truth. And this connection is taken directly from the playbook of the late Nietzsche who uh, writes in Zarathustra, quote, and even you, seeker of knowledge, are only a path and footstep of this will to power that indeed follows on the heels of your will to the truth, end of quote. So Foucault's concept of power is actually built upon the late Nietzsche's metaphysics of power. And uh, this means it becomes in Foucault's usage, an all-pervading life force, which lurks uh, without qualifications uh, from every angle in, in every direction, always attached to knowledge and truth claims, uh, no matter by whom, for whom, uh, what kind uh, of power, uh, to what ends. So what is excluded from Foucault's analysis are precisely the qualitative questions of whose power, what power, the power to do what, etc. So the uh, Greek, uh, French, Marxist uh, Nikos Poulantzas, who has learned a lot from Foucault, uh, from Foucault, by the way, 
who discussed him uh, a lot and uh, was inspired by some parts of his analysis, uh, he rightly pointed out that Foucault's alleged microphysics of power is in reality an essentialist construct of a master power, maître pouvoir, uh, as a prime founder of all the uh, struggle. So behind uh, the rhetoric of a multiple micropower lies the idea of a essentialist phagocytic essence, as uh, Poulantzas calls it, uh, um, a phagocytic essence that invades and penetrates both the mechanisms of domination, of hegemony from above, uh, and of resistance or hegemony from, or counter hegemony from below, glossing over all social contradictions and struggles. So power in Foucault's usage is not used as, a, as an analytical tool to decipher social relations. It is located behind these social relations, behind any relation of production and reproduction. And that is the, the, the Nietzschean characteristics of power. And that's why Foucault opposes his power concept to Marx's critique of exploitation. And this opposition doesn't make any sense because uh, for Marx, the appropriation of unpaid surplus value, surplus labor, is of course a power question. Um, the economy is uh, not a thing. It, it, it represents a crystallized form of power relations, certainly not the only one, but a very dense and institutionalized and, and asymmetrical one. One could argue that the Foucauldian claim uh, to extend the analysis of power beyond Marx's critique of uh, exploitation and appropriation is a justified uh, issue or justified endeavor and, and a potentially fruitful one. Um, but um, to put it as an opposite um, um, to uh, Marx's uh, critique of uh, capitalism is uh, misleading. Uh, it leads actually to an analysis that uh, excludes structurally anchored uh, uh, power structures. Um, and um, I mean, Foucault sometimes promises what he calls an ascending analysis, starting out from the microstructures of power and moving up to the macro structures of class and state domination, but he never gets there uh, because he has no theoretical account of how power is being accumulated and assembled. Hmm. There's been a lot written lately about Michel Foucault's connections to the neoliberal project more broadly speaking. I'm thinking here of the work of Foucault and neoliberalism by Daniel Zamora and um, Michael Barrent. Um, could you talk a little bit about how you see the relationship between uh, Foucault's uh, philosophy and perhaps maybe we should speak also of the Nietzschean connection to this as well? Uh, could you could you elaborate a bit more about this, please? Yeah. Um, this book that you just mentioned had made a quite a quite a splash. There was a huge controversy about um, about the assumptions of of that book. <coughs> so. Uh, some authors, um, like, for instance, Foucault's disciple, François Ewald, um, argue that um, Foucault was actually influenced by the neoliberal economist Gary Becker and uh, his uh, rational choice theory and uh, human capital theory. And actually, Foucault quotes Becker quite frequently in his lectures on biopolitics. So, uh, 1978. 1979. And other scholars like, for instance, Wendy Brown argue that Foucault's lectures in the 70s demonstrated an extraordinary prescience about the new formation that was just beginning to take shape. So we have this kind of controversy. And uh, I try to do both in a way um, in my book. Um, on the one hand, I try to tease out what aspects of his observations uh, could be used for a critical analysis of neoliberalism. And on the other hand, identify the points where his observations flip over to an alignment with neoliberalism. So on the 
according to my understanding or to my analysis, on the one hand, Foucault is one of the few public intellectuals who took neoliberalism seriously and tried to conceptualize it before it came to power. The context is that many leftists didn't realize what, what was going on uh, and did not analyze it. Maybe the, the other important figure that did it, that did analyze it, Stuart Hall, uh, with the example of, of, uh, of the UK. So, uh, and Foucault is interested in something really interesting, namely the ways neoliberalism produces its subjects as entrepreneurs uh, of themselves and how this enterprise form uh, spreads uh, throughout the entire society. And there are many interesting aspects. The main point of alignment with neoliberalism is in his fascination by a new governmentality that is no more applied to the subjects directly in the way of a moralizing disciplinary power, but rather to their economic and social environment. Or we could say this is not so new. Uh, when Marx talks about the silent uh, compulsion of economic relations, this is already there. Um, um, uh, but uh, Foucault believes that this new kind of uh, power opens the way to a new acceptance of differences and fluctuating processes in which minorities um, are better tolerated and uh, um, acknowledged, etc. So Foucault is very sensitive on that, on that front, so to say. He has no objections against the neoliberal dismantling of the welfare state and the widening gap between rich and poor. And, and this is certainly uh, due to a Nietzschean disregard for social equality. Now, I mean, this whole uh, fantasy of uh, Foucault of a post-disciplinary power uh, in, in neoliberalism is, um, is pretty problematic, to say the least. Um, I mean, he was obviously not aware that the economic doctrine of neoliberalism was first put into practice in Chile uh, in the state terrorist framework uh, of uh, the dictatorship under Pinochet. <laughs> Very disciplinary, so to say, to say the least. And the neoliberal utopia of uh, this kind of post-disciplinary governmentality has nothing to do with the really existing uh, neoliber neoliberalism and what it does on the ground, um, I mean, it developed its own ways of disciplinary power through the deregulation of labor relations and uh, the marketization of former non-economic domains of society. Um, I think one could say, and um, by the way, Loïc Vacan is the, the, the famous disciple of, of Bourdieu, is uh, arguing that way, that neoliberalism ha um, has a, a kind of Janus face, a kind of centaur uh, uh, figure, or is a kind of centaur figure, um, which can be more open and liberal and caring at the top and among the middle classes, um, but is, is fearsome and paternalistic towards the uh, lower classes. I mean, you can see that, uh, that when neoliberalism started, the prison system in uh, the US went up and up, uh, uh, in, in, in an enormous way uh, from the end of the 70s uh, onwards. So um, Foucault was part of the so-called second left, the deuxième gauche, uh, which turned uh, against an egalitarian tradition of the left in France, represented primarily by the Communist Party, which was very, very, very strong at the time. We shouldn't forget that. It was a 20-something percent uh, party. And, and, and the trade union, CGT, etc. So he articulates exactly the point at which the post-68 movement's critique of normalization of authority, of discipline, and so could meet and merge with a neoliberal critique of a bureaucratic and stifling welfare state. Ah, let me add something. So when the interesting thing is when, when neoliberalism then actually came to power, let's say 79 uh, Thatcher's victory in, in, in the UK, 1980 uh, um, uh, uh, Ronald Reagan, I mean, came to power in the centers of capitalism, right? 
uh, Foucault did not bother anymore uh, whether whether his utopia of a post-disciplinary uh, governmentality uh, had anything to do with reality. He he moved on he, and, and moved back at the same time and, and he turned to uh, Greek and Hellenistic and Roman antiquity and traced the development uh, from an original Greek ethics centered on the techniques of the self to uh, uh, the universalist so-called pastoral morality of Christianity. And interestingly, if you, if you follow his argument, uh, this trajectory uh, moves again within Nietzsche's grand narrative, stretching from an ancient Ur aristocracy to its transvaluation by the Judea uh, Christian slave revolt in morals. And, and against um, this plebeian transvaluation, he develops Nietzsche now his battle cry, a uh, transvaluation of all values at the end of the Antichrist. So Foucault's, uh, and Foucault's narrative kind of follows that. A little bit less value judgments maybe, but uh, the, the thrust is, uh, is very similar. His uh, interest in the techniques of the self is clearly inspired by Nietzsche's elitist ethics as a sophisticated art of life where you pursue your your, your 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 happiness your, your your look out for your for your happiness as as uh, the golden spark at the at the belly of the of the serpent and so on uh, but uh, without any uh, universalist and, and humanistic uh, concerns and Foucault's care of the self ethics is compatible with the neoliberal transvaluation of of values it's a kind of um, uh, Murray Bookchin calls it a lifestyle anarchism, and he criticizes that from the point yeah. of view of social anarchism. Yeah. yeah, that's very helpful. And a lot, a lot has been written about trying to incorporate Foucault's repertoire of ideas and concepts for Marxist ends. So there is a growing literature, but there's also a growing literature which disputes uh, that compatibility. Uh, and I want to make a connection to your work, uh, Theories of Ideology on um, Alienation and Subjection, which is another text which we don't have the time to talk about in this interview. But I think one important link to it, and you do write about it there, but I want to uh, put this on the table now, is, okay, Foucault dismisses ideology critique in general. And this is well established. Um, but I want to ask you, in your opinion, um, by replacing it with the theory of discourse, yeah, uh, what 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 do we lose? What what is what is kind of uh, the downside of this uh, pivot away from from Marxist ideology critique? Okay, uh, so. Um... I mean, um, already in uh, his book, Archaeology of Knowledge, uh, Foucault dissolved ideology into knowledge and discourse, and, and then later transformed that into his concept of power. And in my view, by doing so, he took out the critical edge out of the Marxist concept of, of ideology. So for Foucault, when he talks about ideology, he caricatures it as nothing but false consciousness, subordinated to economics, etc. Et and this uh, is, is a usual trick, so to say, used by many. They make a caricature of the uh, um, adversary and uh, in order to, 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 to make a point and to make it more plausible to overcome it, to superannuate it. And, uh, and uh, an extensive literature praises Foucault for having finally replaced the outdated Marxist orthodoxy with this microphysics of power. It, it's difficult to find uh, uh, secondary literature that does not do that, does not praise that uh, uh, overcoming of the theory of ideology. So, so that's the easy game that Foucault is trying to play and with him uh, lots of uh, uh, Foucault literature. Uh, in reality, Marxist ideology theory has already moved far beyond the notion of 
false consciousness. And I, and, and I need to take a little a little detour for making that that clear. There was already Gramsci in the 1930s who criticized the economistic and deterministic shortcomings that undermined uh, Marxism's potentials as a philosophy of praxis. And um, according to his theory of hegemony, the terrain of ideologies are to be studied uh, as a sturdy reality anchored in the superstructure, produced by hegemonic structures, not just as illusions, etc., but a sturdy reality, a real terrain, social societal terrain. And then in the 1970s and 1980s, you uh, got uh, the so-called ideology theoretical turn initiated first by Louis Althusser in France and then developed further by Stuart Hall um, in the UK and, uh, and, in, and the Berlin research group Projekt Ideologie Theory, in which I had the chance uh, to participate when I was a young student. Um, and regardless of all the differences between these schools, uh, they basically agreed on this. You must not reduce the concept of ideology to a phenomenon of consciousness. If you want to understand why and how subjects voluntarily submit to alienated and restrictive uh, conditions, you need to take the proper materiality of the ideological theory. Uh, what does it mean? Materiality in, in, in Gramscian terms, it would be the hegemonic apparatuses. I would say, would uh, say ideological state apparatuses. The late Engels already talked about ideological powers like the state, politics, the law, religion. So not just consciousness, but real uh, powerful institutions. So uh, take the materiality of the ideological seriously, uh, not just the apparatuses, but also the ideologues that work there, certain types of intellectuals, the rituals that are uh, that, that that are operated there, uh, other forms, ideological forms of praxis, and also what uh, I just said called ideological inter interpolations. So the ideological subjection not only impacts uh, your consciousness, your opinions, it operates mainly unconsciously uh, by images, etc., and anchors itself in bodily dispositions and, and attitudes, for instance, what Baudieu calls habitus. So it formats the subjectivity of the subject. So it's far away just from false consciousness. So this is one achievement. The second achievement of Marxist ideology theories developed mostly after uh, Althusser and partly against him was the insight that ideological subjugation works not only in a one way top down manner, um, but in a more differentiated and um, complicated way. Stuart Hall has shown, for instance, that the coding of an ideological message and its decoding by the subject, by the interpolated subject, um, are not necessarily the same. That might be uh, what he calls a hegemonic decoding, where you kind of um, accept the interpolation and act and think and feel accordingly. Um, but there can also be a negotiated decoding. You accept part of the interpolation and you do not accept other parts. And, uh, and so you kind of negotiate a compromise in this ideological battlefield. There can also be a fundamentally oppositional uh, decoding that you, uh, that you what, let's say, watch television and you say what, what, what they tell you about the the progress of economy, that's just bullshit. And uh, we know that's different and they'd lie to us. So that would be an oppositional uh, decoding. Um, the Projekt Ideologie Theory conceptualizes as an antagonistic reclamation of ideological uh, values. That means the same uh, ideological symbols and values are inter interpreted, interpreted in, a, in, in an opposite way. Different classes, genders, generations interpret very differently what God's will is, what justice means, what morality proclaims, etc. So under certain uh, circumstances, subaltern classes can claim these ideological values as well, turn them around, reappropriate them, 
but they can also, by the same token, be reabsorbed into the mainstream. Cultural flowers are continually picked by the ideological powers and the cultural industry and handed back down from above as unwithering artificial flowers. So uh, that's just to show uh, the ideological is a field that is traversed by manifold uh, social antagonisms and struggles. Sorry for that detour, but um, it is a, important for making my point. Um, it is in particular these two achievements of Marxist ideology theories, the materiality of the, ideology, of the ideological and the antagonistic reclamation of ideological values that got all but lost in the transition to postmodernism. Uh, to start with the latter, the uh, antagonistic reclamation, reclamation. Uh, let's look at Foucault. His concept of power is not interested in the, different, in the differences between a power of domination from above and a collective power from below in the sense um, of Spinoza's capacity to act uh, potentia agenda. He has no sense for the class struggle within the ideological. And regarding the materiality of the, ideo of the ideological, we need to have in mind that postmodernist and uh, poststructuralist theories emerge to a large extent from a radicalization of the linguistic turn. And therefore, they focused, in fact, almost entirely on language, on texts, on signifiers. And this also applies to Foucault, uh, who is fixated on the pedagogical discourses around prison, for instance, but not on the actual conditions of the prisoners. So even the famous panopticon that he pulls out of uh, uh, Jeremy Benson uh, was mainly a, a vision uh, in the prison literature, a debated issue at conference, etc. But it was almost never built, only twice to my knowledge, uh, Joliet in Illinois and La Petite Rochette in France. And another example in his, uh, his history of sexuality, Foucault focuses uh, the first volume. He focuses on the confession of the Catholic Church and, and its constraints of uh, truth-telling. And then he follows that uh, uh, to un, up to, to psychoanalysis. Um, uh, but he does not analyze confession as part of the ideological apparatus of the Church. And if he did that, if he had done that, he would see that Confession functions alongside systematic repression by the Inquisition, so it doesn't stand alone. So the consequence of this discursive one-sidedness of, of uh, uh, postmodernism is uh, an inner contradiction. On the one hand, uh, poststructuralists and postmodernists are often pretty strong in, in their deconstructive project of denaturalization de of fixed meanings and identities. Um, um, and there are some interesting intersections with the Marx, Marxian term concept of dialectics, uh, which always means to take uh, the fluid development of, of uh, history, of phenomena, uh, seriously and turn it or, or see the contradiction to the fixed form, etc. So there is some interesting intersection with that. And on the other hand, this denaturalization regularly morphs into an overall dematerialization. And by this, I mean both a dematerialization of human practices and of uh, social relations. No, uh, human practices, social relations on the one hand and of the body on the other hand. So. Um, Dematerialization of human practices and social relation means um, that uh, the social is reduced to the symbolic, basically. And dematerialization of the body means uh, you get uh, kind of uh, disembodied human subjects who appear as effects of discourses and, and chains of signifiers. Uh, David McNally has aptly criticized this as a disembodied linguistic uh, idealism in his book, uh, Bodies of Meaning, I think, yeah, Bodies of Meaning. So therefore, I think uh, that Marxist theory has a double task. 
in regards to postmodernism, um, a deconstructive one, to take up uh, the terminology of postmodernism and turn it against it, a deconstructive one and a reconstructive one. And the deconstructive task means we need to criticize whenever postmodernist theories dematerialize and disembody social life or repress the antagonisms and contradictions of capitalism. Uh, we need to show uh, always again uh, how the postmodernist celebrations of social fragmentations and simulacra are in line with neoliberal ideology or uh, with, the, with the digital imaginary of high-tech capitalism. And the reconstructive task means that after having learned postmodernism's valuable insights, the instability of meaning, the permanent shifting of signifiers, etc., we need to release these insights from their narrow postmodernist framework and re-embed them in a renewed uh, critical uh, ideology theory. Um, speeches, texts, images, they are important. It's not about uh, uh, neglecting them. They are an important part of an ideological subjection and, uh, and ideological struggles. Uh, but they need to be analyzed in the practical and institutional context in which they are embedded. And they need to be analyzed in the, in the perspective uh, of a critique of, of capitalism, of mm -hmm. current um, high-tech capitalism and its ideologies. Yes. Excellent. I really want to thank you for that. I, I guess two themes stand out to me. One is a postmodernist critique of ideology, which they don't really, they kind of abandon, they, 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 deem, they focus too much on the linguistic, uh, end up celebrating social fragmentation in a, in a sense, or not celebrating, but they um, try to derive something possibly liberatory in this social fair. And I think you see this actually in Anti-Oedipus by Deleuze and Guattari, where they propose accelerationism. And uh, it mm -hmm. is no surprise that Silicon Valley can adopt that philosophy as a justification for venture capitalists to uh, exploit the taxi industry or to uh, dis they call it creative destruction, right? <laughs> so the, the postmodern philosopher um, fetishizes social fragmentation. I think the other thing that you maybe hinted at, which I got myself from reading your book on ideology, is uh, the postmodern theorists often cannot, cannot, nor do they care, to account for the question of the lived experience of the subaltern or of the working class and i was very struck by that idea and i think maybe that's a, a big big idea we can discuss in a future program because there's many many consequences that come from this neglect in my opinion yes. you know let me add one little uh, complication to that please unfortunately um, the neglect of lived experiences can also be found in some theories of ideology already, namely the Althusserian uh, uh, theory of ideology. If you look at the um, model of uh, ideological interpolation, which is certainly an interesting model, you see uh, the big subject interpolating the small subject, God interpolates Moses, for instance. Huh? And the only thing that Moses can do is uh, turn around, say, yes, Lord, here I am, your subject, Moses, and uh, what do you want me to do, basically? You know? And uh, so, uh, in fact, uh, subjects can do many things uh, when they are integrated. They can also turn around and say, no, that's not for me. <laughs> uh, mm. Sorry, but, uh, or I, I, I oppose that. But the basis on which these kind of moves are being decided or determined are experiences mm. in reality. And I just said doesn't have a notion for that because everything is devoured by, by his concept of the imaginary that he took from Lacan, etc. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So in my view, Gramsci is much more helpful in that because he has, on the one hand, the concept of common sense, mm -hmm. contradictory uh, 
uh, heterogeneous and uh, often paralyzing because of its contradictions. And one sensor, the good sense, which is the capacity to observe, the capacity to make experiences, hmm. uh, the, the will to make experiences, or the, the desire to make experience, to try out uh, interesting that. So this can be, uh, for Gramsci, a point of critique, uh, 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 an anchorage point or a starting point to critique common sense. Mm -hmm. So here we have the lived experiences in Gramsci's framework mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that uh, any philosophy of practice need to connect with mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in order to criticize the inconsistencies of uh, common yeah. sense. Yeah, as somebody who's written a book myself on Lacanian theory, I was challenged in reading your book uh, okay. because I was myself conceiving of ideology generally in this post althusserian mode of analysis. And I think the uh, that there one idea or consequence I had that comes from Althusser's theory of ideology in general, and this is my own uh, assumption, uh, I have not yet fully developed that I'm working on something though, is that in fact, it leads to a kind of um, pessimistic fatalism when it comes to things like, say, the uh, class struggle or trying to promote socialist education. Because in a way, it presents a picture in which uh, resistance or escape or from ideology, ideological capture is almost impossible. So it doesn't really give us the kind of tools to think uh, mediations which might go beyond ideological capture. It becomes uh, maybe too too all enveloping, and it doesn't speak about ideology as what you call processes of socialization, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't look at the the granulated uh, socialization processes, which are determined by class relations as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I found all of those points extraordinarily valuable. But again, it's uh, it maybe a topic for a, a future interview because there's so much. Yeah. And one of the big things there is, you know, how do people uh, in the working, working in critical theory, one of the things I want to talk to you about is begin to adopt uh, 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 your model more so because I think it has a great empirical contribution to make because you can analyze Black Lives Matter, you can analyze Occupy Wall Street, Bernie Sanders from a different lens, you know, and uh, that's refreshing. I think so. I see. I think. I think it can have a more practical effect, not only within the academy but in the socialist movement. You mm -hmm. know, since you worked on on Lacan and and you're deep deeply involved in psychoanalysis. Just an anecdotal uh, story. I, I was very much, uh, I didn't study psychoanalysis, but I, um, but I read a lot and I was very much into that framework for a long, long time, for decades maybe. And um, Freud and Wilhelm Reich at the time, mm -hmm. <laughs> Wilhelm Reich, not fashionable right now, but, and later than Lacan, but that was already, I uh, already left the psychoanalytic framework a little bit. For me, it was a liberation to get out of the psychoanalytical framework, namely really? by, by reading. I, I mean, it, it might have been a liberation when I got into it <laughs> when I was a youngster <laughs> and I read Wilhelm Reich and Sexual Revolution as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, some decades later, uh, it was a liberation to get out of it. And I, that, uh, I could do that by really reading um, the books of uh, critical psychology, the Berlin School of critical psychology uh, founded by Klaus Holzkamp and others, which mm. is a Marxist uh, psychology, which leaves room for the development of capacity to act. Yeah. Which is, has, has a difficult position in psychoanalysis because it's always right. a detour. A capacity right. to act and this kind of uh, ego strength that is needed to, for capacity to act is, is always uh, looked at in a suspicious way. Uh, mm -hmm. Especially mm -hmm. by Deleuze and, and, and folks, and by Lacan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that would be a, an, another interesting discussion about yeah, yeah. ideology theory and psychoanalysis. Yeah, yeah this is why I, I always, uh, there's a big debate since the uh, 
very widely read work of uh, Mikkel Heinrich and value form Marxism in the Anglo-American intellectual spaces because Heinrich gives a hint against what he calls worldview Marxism, Marxism of uh, Weltanschauung, Marxism which was of rooted in workers' movement, rooted in the struggle of the people. And he says, this is all kind of collapsed. This is no, no more is our uh, social struggles oriented in that way. And so for me, it's been a revelation to read Lukács, to read Lacerdo, to read your work. I'm not combining you, but generally, I think it opens up a different avenue by which we can think re-interrogate Marxism differently because there are many, I think, tendencies that want to pretend that the old uh, paradigms of thinking, because much of your work on ideology is working as a return to angles as well. And, uh, you know, I find that extremely valuable. Um, so I think it's it's very important for people to be exposed to your uh, to to your work. And I, again, I want to invite you to maybe to speak with me in the future, because I love also the example you use from South Africa as one of your primary case studies of the We Are the Poor's movement, uh, which I intend to, to research further as well. But I had the vision that, again, you could you could apply the, the method to a number of case studies, right? Uh, because it gives you a different result than the postmodernist or the officer, and it gives you a different, you know, a different um, way of looking at the situation, um, and and also of being in the situation. You know, I think it has a, it implies a different uh, orientation for those that want to do socialist education, because I've been really interested in that. You know, um, I think a lot of a lot of education needs to to happen even outside of the the academy, um, and we know the 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 hostility that the academy has to to marxist uh, study uh even though the conservatives say that it's all marxists in the academy <laughs> it's not true mm -hmm. um but this is a good place we've had about an hour and a half i would like to close and yep. i'd like to thank you for your great answers and um really want to just tell everybody to get jan's work and to take it to study it and we will hopefully see you again on the program. I wanted to thank you, Daniel, for inviting me and for that interesting preparation we did for that interview, mm -hmm. back and forth, and and very fruitful. And uh, I wish you good luck and endurance for writing your book. <laughs> it's, it's, it's been, I need the strength. I, I think reading Nietzsche has made me realize that you need a lot of strength because there's a big theme for him, you know? And mm -hmm. uh, when you work with him, it's not easy. It's not easy. It's a it's a real labor. You know, it's a real labor. And my wife is she can see it. You know, <laughs> <It's a> real... <laughs> but anyways, thank, I will need the luck. But I'll, I will end it here. And thanks everyone for for listening. Okay. Bye. Thanks.